Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark M.C. Neal. We're joined today by Rosa Clemente, 2008 Green Party Vice Presidential Candidate, also a doctoral candidate in the W. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at UMass Amherst, and of course, a longtime community organizer and independent journalist. How are you doing, Rosa? I'm great. How are you? Thank you for having me again. Oh, it's always great to have you on the show, and, and, and we do have a lot to talk about. Um, so much has happened over the last year, you know, obviously if we kind of track things from, from Ferguson. And, and one of the things that has emerged, of course, is Black Lives Matter. And as someone who, ha who has been doing grassroots organizing for 20 plus years, um, how do you feel about the presence of Black Lives Matter at this point in time in terms of what it has achieved, what you think it's capable of achieving, uh, and what ways you might think it, it could possibly be limited? Well, I mean, on a very personal level for me, um, Black Lives Matter really exploded right after I was in Ferguson last year with uh, Talib, Kweli, Jessica Moore, and, and a lot of folks um, right after Michael Brown and the rebellion happened. And I moved to L.A. to teach at Cal State for the year as a visiting lecturer. And what I say to Black Lives Matter and to anyone who asks me is I found my organizing self again, <laughs> something I felt I had lost um, a little bit because I'm working on my doctorate. <laughs> and it, it's hard, right, to be a full scholar activist while you're trying to get to that point. But also... Um, I felt that my generation, or as I like to refer to myself, as this kind of first wave of hip-hop folks that use mm -hmm. hip-hop mm -hmm. as a political tool, mm -hmm. had dropped the ball on some levels. Um, and also the pacification of anything around race um, during President, or let's say uh, as President Obama was running and elected. So for me, Black Lives Matter brought me back to kind of that hardcore organizing, how to we do this work in the streets? How do we not get co-opted? How don't we just ask for reform, but really look at transformative fundamental change? Um, so I was in Black Lives Matter LA chapter up until a couple weeks ago when I moved back to New York. So for me, I, I love everything that Black Lives Matter um, represents. With that love then comes critique and how we can do things better um, so that we're not just a moment but a full-blown movement that really hits at particular what I think Black Lives Matter needs to work on now is how we talk about the class contradictions within our own community mm -hmm. that makes some of us able to oppress a lot of the folks in our own community. Do you think of Black Lives Matter as a political movement? Like, and, and I guess... You know, it's just really playing around turns if you want to say whether or not it's a social music versus a political movement. But do you think it's a, the type of movement that will move the needle in terms of both non-traditional and traditional politics? It can be if it's not co-opted. And I, I think co-optation can come all the way from the top as we're trying to, as we've seen as of yesterday where the Democratic National yeah. Committee puts out a statement about Black Lives Matter but didn't talk to any of the leaders of Black Lives Matter. Um, the co-optation could come like that, but it could also come when we rely too much on the electoral political system to right the wrongs, to fix the system itself. If we, we do not engage in electoral politics as a tizing, we just either shutting down a Bernie Sanders, just confrontation without understanding that a lot of our folks aren't going to vote anyway, and what does that mean, and why are they not, and that a lot of people are beyond voting. That voting actually, to me, is now within this, I, how we talk about a petty bourgeoisie in our community and, and something that is fundamentally very flawed and not working. So I think that's where Black Lives Matter stands right now as a national conversation and discourse. And um, I'm 50-50 on that. You know, I, I want it to be the most radical thing we can have out there. 
and other folks can work on reform. But I think the reason Black Lives Matter resonated with so many people across class contradictions and across all of us who are black, no matter if, if we're black from Puerto Rico or Mississippi or um, Me Mexico or, or the Bronx, is that it, it was reclaiming our humanity, not asking for people to give us our humanity and dignity, but taking it back. You mentioned something earlier in your comments that, that struck me as, as, as rather interesting. I mean, when we think about the emergence of Black Lives Matter, uh, we know about police violence against black bodies, right? We, we know that it's a response to that. We know that it's a response to corporate media and their regular depictions of black lives, uh, which are distortions, right? But, but you also suggest that in part, you know, Black Lives Matter rises in response to an Obama presidency. Um, can you unpack that a little bit? I mean, the main reason it rises is because we had a academic discussion that said we were post-racial. <laughs> then we see policies coming out of the Obama administration um, that were slow to respond to what progressism less had elected him to do and were holding him accountable with an upsurgence of um, police brutality where we can actually document that this is happening every 28 hours. If you add Latinos and Native folks, that number drops probably to every 16 hours. The state violence perpetrated on us. But I think there was some precursors, not only um, about Obama, be President Obama being the black male president of the United States. I think within two years of his presidency, a lot of lefts and progressives that voted for President Obama and had hoped that the Democratic Party would move where the, the people were right. moving and pushed right. them, um, within two or three years that was dissipating. Mm -hmm. But couple that too with the execution of Troy Davis, which was done Absolutely. in the most egregious, underhanded, um, slick moment for those that were rallying for, for Troy's life that night. We go home thinking his execution was stopped. By the time many of us are at home, we're seeing our Twitter feeds and our Facebooks telling us he had just been executed. Then, of course, we have Trayvon and George Zimmerman walking. Um, and so I, I think it's been a confluence of things. I don't think without an Obama presidency would we have young people that had so much hope yeah, so quickly yeah, yeah, marginalized yeah. and mind you these are young people in college right young people that are finishing high school we're not really talking about right like for the most part cats in ferguson and baltimore that since eighth grade have been marginalized from a system and were rebelling in their own ways and then come to a full rebellion we're talking about this millennial African-American Latino generation that kind of did everything that they were told they were supposed to do. do. We've yeah. done everything yeah. and then some of right but yet we're still being killed because it's not only poor black people that are being killed it's not only men it's not only African-Americans the state violence is being perpetrated on us regardless of class geographic location or where we fall within that African diaspora. It's being perpetrated on us because white folks and white supremacy is fearing, as public enemy taught us, the fear of a black planet. So no, I don't think without the President Obama administration or without President Obama being president, would we be where we're at right now? You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with longtime community organizer and independent journalist, Rosa Clemente, who also is a doctoral candidate in the W. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at UMass Amherst. And of course, she was the 2008 Green Party vice presidential candidate. You mentioned about the Democratic Party really moving from the left to the center, if it even was at the left in 2008. And of course, I, I know because you are deeply embedded in uh, social media, I, I know the number of Facebook friends you have cut off <laughs> because they have suggested to you um, that you should hop on board the Hillary train. <laughs> so, so we know where you feel about that. But how are you feeling about Bernie Sanders' candidacy? I mean... I feel Bernie Sanders is a Democrat. You know, I don't think he's a socialist. I don't think he's that progressive. I mean, yesterday he announced he would still keep the drone policy. Yeah. Okay, these are drones that I just saw flying in Ferguson two weeks ago, right. monitoring right. people. 
um, he was completely pushed by Black Lives Matter, just like all the candidates have, to pretend they care about racial justice. Do I believe it? Absolutely not. And as a historian and as someone who ran for office, the history is there. I can show you the proof where we've had many racial justice agendas, many promises, and none have been kept by who we deem to be the most progressive people. I'm in New York. Mayor de Blasio is not a progressive to black and brown poor people in the hoods right now that are onslaught fighting gentrification and the, 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 the school system is an utter failure, right? And, 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 and the policies he's enacted. So if de Blasio comes out as a progressive mass, and then we see the actual policies are not progressive, they're reformists um, at the very best. Yeah. I don't, like, I'm not a Bernie Sanders fan, but, but I'm also not a Democrat, you know? And um, I'm still riding with the Green Party, but I'll be honest and say the Green Party is not doing a great job either at, at, at grabbing those that want to participate in electoral politics as a strategy, want to hold elected officials accountable, but all these parties do not want to see black and Latino left radical leadership leading them. Mm -hmm. They think that we're out here uh, toting guns and burning down buildings. And you know what? That's going to happen regardless. We've seen that happen right now. We're seeing rebellions. That has nothing to do with the electoral political process. We got to meet where the, where the people are at. And my heart believes that most people are really where the class contradiction lies. Um, and I don't even think Bernie Sanders will address that yeah. to the point where it will alleviate the material conditions of mo most of our folks on the ground. How do you explain the Donald Trump phenomenon? Oh, oh, the Donald <laughs> <laughs> um, Wow. Um, you know, white supremacy needed a face. <laughs> the empire needed a, a black president to keep it relatively moving while it crumbles. And white supremacy needs a new face. One that is unabashed, unafraid, unbought, yeah. unapologetic. Um, you know, I don't like to make light of it because I do understand that the rhetoric actually leads to action, right? So his rhetoric has led to a number of young white men saying that they're beating up homeless Latino men because of what Donald Trump, Trump said. said right. I think we have to take those anecdotes and stories very seriously. Just like the police want to say that this uh, young man that's accused of murdering uh, a police officer uh, this weekend did it because of Black Lives Matter, which is Right. I mean, absurd, you cannot even right. make that connection. Absurd, yeah. But these white boys actually said, no, it's what Donald Trump said that's making me want to do this. So I don't, I don't like to make life worry about a Latino, Latina community that is lumped into one category, that has not found its political footing, that is often used whether by capitalism or by the Democratic Party um, as this kind of new majority and new population. Um, and obviously, any rhetoric that is hateful and inhumane, we wanna have a, we wanna go against. But then, part of me is also like, we are so falling into the trap. We are falling into the mainstream media trap, because what Donald Trump is saying is actually things that are happening every day on the ground, particularly for Latino people, those that are undocumented. They're facing that on a re real, real basis. Their lives are literally on their line or their families are being broken up or they're being herded into immigrant detention. Um, so, you know, I think Donald Trump is the, the rising that the white majority in this country wants. And I believe a lot of white folks, even if they don't want to admit it, kind of like what he has to say. They kind of like it. Um, my fear is that potentially he could be president. That yeah, And yeah. that, I mean, I, I have to say, is a very scary yeah. thought. Right. But if George Bush could steal the election in 2000, I don't put it past the Republicans to do anything in their power to regain that presidency. 
We've been talking with Rosa Clemente, longtime community activist and, of course, independent journalist. Uh, how is that dissertation at UMass Amherst coming? <laughs> Well, everybody in academia knows that's the worst question you can ever ask somebody. So, poor Dr. Neil. <laughs> I would say that, um, you know, this year was so critically important yeah. Yeah. Um, for me to be engaged the way I was. Um, my dissertation on Afro-Latino identity and politics will have something in it that three years did not exist. Yeah. Black right. Lives Matter. Right. And what that means politically on the ground, what that means to an emerging Afro-Latino community in the United States that's finding its blackness, yeah. it, that's fighting back anti-black sentiment, that's also becoming very politically astute and becoming very aware of what black and brown solidarity means. Um, with that said, you know, within the next two years, you will be seeing Dr. Clemente. <laughs> and um, I, I, part of that, and I tell a lot, a lot of folks, is that part of our activism and organizing must always remember the highly intellectual tradition that right. we come from, particularly right. as African-American right. and Latino folks. I mean, we look at the work of Schomburg to Du Bois to Fannie Lou to Ida B. Wells and on and on, right? These are people that, to me, always doctors right. before right. they could even be a doctor and were also on the ground doing some amazing work and using their intellectual brevity and, and knowledge to really um, move visions of liberation forward. And I want to be part of that tradition and will be part of that tradition. Absolutely. Rosa Clemente is, was the 2008 Green Party president, vice presidential candidate. She's a longtime community organizer and independent journalist. She is our home, go home girl from the BX. She is our home girl from SUNY Albany. Thanks, as always, for joining us on Left of Black, Rosa. Oh, thank you. And thank you all for your amazing show and just the work that you're doing is incredible to you and your team, Mark. Thanks so much. I'll see folks in Duke in a couple of weeks. Yes, take care. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it